Hello, and welcome to the Deathcast, the place where the cool and creepy kids come to learn about their true crime. I'm your host, author, and journalist, Ian Totten. As always, I'd like to thank you for joining me as we prepare to take another look at a true crime case. By the time you're hearing this, we should have hit 100,000 downloads lifetime for the podcast. I just want to take a brief moment to thank every single person out there who listens to this show, shares it on social media, and enjoys what I do. We do have some big things going on behind the scenes here at the show, and as soon as I can publicly discuss them, I promise you I will. Couple of quick show notes. If you are interested in getting any of the show merchandise, shirts, coffee mugs, that kind of thing, you can go to tinyurl.com backslash dcastpodmerch. For those of you who have purchased a shirt, it is greatly appreciated. If you are interested in becoming a member of the Coffee Club, you can go to buymeacoffee.com backslash deathcast. We don't have any new members over there this week, however. We do have some shout-outs for the old Coffee Club through PayPal. Big thank you to Jason from New Jersey. Kara J from Syracuse, New York. Tony from Ottawa, Quebec, Canada. These fine people went to the website and clicked on the donate button. I raised my coffee cup to them. If you would like to get acknowledged and shouted out on the show, again, you can go to buymeacoffee.com backslash deathcast or go to corpsecreekpublishing.com and click on the donate button. Now that all that is out of the way, get yourself something to drink, find a nice comfy chair, kick back and relax. I've got my coffee, I've got my cigarettes. Let's go into the crypt. We are going back to Japan this week because my coverage of the Junko Furuta case got such a reaction from the listeners in Japan, and I do nothing if not try and give the people content that they're going to enjoy as well as learn from. This week we are going to be covering the case of Satomo Miyazaki. As with the case of Junko Furuta, there is a content warning with this particular series of crimes. And I want to warn everyone before we really get rolling that Satomo's crimes were pretty horrific. So if you can't handle graphic descriptions of dismemberment, cannibalism, that sort of thing, you may want to check out for this one. Nobody will hold it against you. These crimes are a bit more extreme than other Crimes I've covered in the past, and it's understandable if you might not be able to handle that. Sutomo Mirzaki was born in Itsukaiji, Japan, which is within the greater Tokyo metropolitan area. And he was born to a very wealthy family on August 21st, 1962. Satomo was born premature, and as a result of this, he had some birth defects. Most notably, his wrists were fused to his forearms, meaning that he could not move his wrists up and down or back and forth, and as a consequence, had to rotate his entire forearm to move his hands. Growing up in Itsukaiji, Satomo's family ran a regional newspaper and were very well known in the area. His family was kind of an institution in Itsukaiji, as both his grandfather and great-grandfather had participated in local politics. Mitsomu's Youth has been described as a fairly lonely existence, as his parents really did not have time to deal with their son, given that they were running this newspaper. 
So it was left to his grandfather and an elderly man who was described as intellectually disabled to raise him. As a student, Mitsomu was described as a shy and quiet student who was ostracized by the other children due to the deformity of his hands. He was often picked on and called names, which from what I understand of Japanese society is, or at least was during this period of time, kind of a cultural norm. If someone was different from the rest of the people, then they were ostracized and, you know, it was made known that you're different from us and therefore you're not as good as or a part of us. And this was such an issue for Mitsomu that any time pictures were taken of him, he went to great lengths to hide his hands from the photographer. As a result of this, he began to lose himself within the world of comic books, which in Japan primarily consists of manga. If you've been alive during the last 40 years, you've come across manga. Oftentimes, it's translated into cartoons, which are called anime. Although I may be slightly mistaken on that, I'm sure a thousand fanboys will email me to correct me on this. But that's the gist of it. It's not massively important to this story, other than he was heavily into comic books, and as he grew older and he found anime, he began losing himself in that as well. Some sources state that Mitsomu dreamed of learning to speak English and becoming a teacher. Tomo was seen as a star student because of his grades, despite his inability to socialize with others. And he ended up going to the Nakano High School, which was a very prestigious high school, as I understand it. It's similar to being sent to, like, a preparatory school. Most students who got sent to this high school, it was kind of a given that upon graduation, they would be offered the opportunity to go to the Meiji University which is located in Chiyoda City, pretty much in the center of Tokyo. Unfortunately, Mizaki's grades began to falter while he was in Nakano High School, to the point that upon graduating, he was ranked 40 out of the 56 students in his class, meaning there was no offer for him to go to college. To give an illustration of how Mizaki adjusted to traveling two hours each way to this Nakano High School, as opposed to engaging his fellow classmates, some sources state that oftentimes he would go off by himself during their free time and breaks and work on a home-drawn comic book. So after finishing high school, Satomo ends up joining a junior college and enrolling in classes to become a photography technician. Satomo's father was very into things like photography and videography, and it's A passion that he passed along to his son, however, unlike his father, Tomu was more interested in videotaping women. Classmates who knew him said that he had a very underdeveloped penis. And you're probably thinking, ew, I didn't want to know that that does play a part in this story because despite the fact that he had an underdeveloped genital area, he had an extremely high sex drive. And because of this, coupled with the fact that he was incapable of talking to women, 
Tomu took to going to tennis courts and parks where he would use the video equipment that his parents had bought him, specifically his mother had bought him, to videotape women, specifically trying to get shots up these women's skirts and dresses. It's also been said, though, that he was very into pornography, which really isn't surprising when you consider his extracurricular activities. However, Tomu eventually lost any desire in adult females, and unfortunately, he started looking towards young girls. And I just want to give a brief content warning right here for this next little piece. You might want to skip ahead a minute or two. When he was eventually arrested and police were questioning him, Satomu stated that one of the reasons he turned towards child pornography was that in Japan, A, it wasn't illegal at that time, and B, with adult women, they were unable to show the pubic hair, so they would black it out. However, since the stuff that he was looking at did not contain pubic hair, they didn't black any of this stuff out, and he was able to see the sex organs, which is what he really wanted to see. After graduating in the spring of 1983, Satomu went to work in a printing plant that was owned by an associate of his father, where he worked as a photography technician for the next three years. So now he's out on his own, working this job and living in this fantasy world inside of his own head where everything is about sex. By 1984, he had moved from looking at images of adult women to images of children. So he's got that going on as well. And unfortunately, for an individual with his mindset during this period of time, the things that he were it was into were not seen as being taboo. So he was able to find a lot of this kind of material that he was into. And a lot of that was inside of the comic books that he was reading. Again, this is something that's going to play into his crimes shortly and will have major ramifications throughout Japan once his crimes become known. By his own admission, during this period of time, Satomo began to become extremely depressed due to his deformities, his inability to converse with people on a peer-to-peer -peer level as well as his inability to speak with women and how he felt shunned by those in society because of his deformity. I've read in some sources that Satomo began to contemplate suicide frequently during this period of time and going forward. However, as anybody who knows anything about Japanese culture can tell you, Suicide is frowned on in Japan without a good reason. And this is going to be confusing to those of us who live in the West. In Japan, it's not considered taboo for an individual to take their own life if they bring shame on their family name or if... You know, they make a major mistake where they work. In fact, it's considered to be an honorable thing. Conversely, if you just take your own life for no reason, it is considered to bring shame to your family. And I don't know if that is still the case, but I know that when Satomo was growing up, that was most certainly the mindset within Japan. For reasons that have never really been explained 1986, Satomo ends up moving back in with his family, despite the fact that he had saved up 
roughly 3 million yen, which in today's currency roughly translates to 22,000 American dollars. Tomu ended up living in a two-room annex, which was located next to his family's business, and he lived there with his eldest sister. Some sources indicate that upon moving back in, it was expected from the family that Tomu would take an interest in their business and eventually take it over, although he had no desire to do this. While Tomu's father really had no interest in his son, preferring to spend his time looking at the new video equipment and doodads that he had purchased. It's been said that his mother, who much like her husband was a workaholic, at least made some sort of an attempt to pacify her son. She was known to purchase expensive gifts for him, including a car which gave him greater freedom and would eventually be used to commit his crimes. Tomu stated that during this period of time, his depression worsened greatly as he really wanted his parents to listen to his problems, but they preferred to focus instead on living their lavish lifestyle and working and at least according to him, he felt that had he brought his problems to his family, they would not have listened to him, as none of his siblings liked him. And from one source that I found, at least his two younger sisters found him disturbing and repulsive, and that's a quote. Now, I want to point out, I know it may sound as though that I'm trying to paint Mazaki in a sympathetic light. I'm not. These are his own words. I don't believe that had things been different in his life, he would have turned out differently. I think it's the exact opposite. I think that it was his genetic makeup that drew him to the things that he became involved with, and also pushed him towards doing the crimes that he committed. In 1988, Stomu's grandfather ended up passing away, and this has been noted by doctors in Japan as really the breaking point for Stomu, as his grandfather was really the only grounding force within his life. Numerous Japanese scholars have stated that his grandfather really was the only person that showed him any type of warmth and, you know, boundaries as far as an adult relationship goes, and that when his grandfather passed away, Stomu was unchained by any form of societal contact. He began spiraling which is a concept that anyone who has listened to the show for a while is well aware of. Oftentimes, when you have an individual that goes on to commit horrific crimes, there is a trigger point for them. With Satomu, it seems as though his grandfather's death is the final nail in the coffin, as it were, on his pretending to be a normal functioning member of society. He dives heavily into pornography more so than before, as well as going out and videotaping women and young girls and creating this fantasy life within his own mind. Satomu later told defense attorneys that when his grandfather died and he was cremated, he ended up eating part of his grandfather's ashes, and this may sound completely out there to most of us, but a lot of people in Japan believe in the idea of reincarnation, and Satomu apparently believed in this as well, so much so that 
in his mind, if he consumed his grandfather's earthly remains, it would allow his grandfather to be reincarnated and therefore allow Satomu to have that connection again with humanity. And I'm not a doctor by any means, but it sounds to me, at least from what I've been able to find, that Satomu may very well have been dealing with some form of schizophrenia coupled with other mental illnesses that pushed him into this idea that by eating his grandfather's remains, the old man would return to him and continue to be a presence in his life. I've also read other reports that stated the reason he ate his grandfather's remains was so that the old man could be with him forever, which... In terms of serial killers, you do encounter this from time to time, this idea that by ingesting the victim's remains, they are now a part of you and you therefore gain their knowledge, memories, and any power that they may have had. Some commentators have stated that both of these ideas were true and were in fact conflated by Tomu's loss of reality inside of the comic books that he was reading as in his mind he started to see them as the reality and the real world as a fantasy. In any event, his grandfather dies and his behavior becomes erratic to the point that there is a split between Satomu and his family. At one point, during 1988, after his grandfather's death, he is watching his youngest sister while she bathes. Some reports state that he was pleasuring himself, others that he was videotaping her. In either case, she becomes angry at him for this, demands that he leave. Satomu flies into a rage, bursts into the bathroom, grabs the young girl, and begins slamming her head off of the side of the tub. This led to a confrontation with his mother, who informs her son that he needs to stop focusing so much on his fantasy world, comic books, and videotapes, and focus more on his job, which leads to Satomu flying into another rage and assaulting his mother. On August 22nd, 1988, the day after Misomu's 26th birthday, Misomu saw a four-year-old girl by the name of Mary Kono, who was playing at a friend's house. Somehow, he was able to coax this little girl into the Nissan car that his mother had given him, and they drove to a wooded area west of Tokyo where he parked the car underneath a bridge. Sources differ as to how long Satomu and this young girl sat inside of the car. Some state that it was upwards of half an hour, while others that they were only there for a few minutes at which point he murdered her, most likely by strangulation. And after murdering her, Satomu molested the body. After killing Marie, Satomu drove back towards his home. Again, this is this annex that he shared with his sister, at least from what I could tell, and disposed of her body in the woods, taking her clothing along with him. The police immediately responded to Kono's disappearance, driving through the city streets and announcing via loudspeakers that parents needed to keep their children, particularly kindergarten age children, in sight at all times. This led to a panic within the area, and parents began to walk their children to their kindergarten classes every day as opposed to allowing them to walk on their own or take public transportation. We will get back to the case in just a moment. 
Cobra Killer, Gay Porn, Murder, and the Manhunt to Bring the Killers to Justice by Andrew E. Stoner and Peter A. Conway is the first and most detailed account of the gay porn murder that shocked a nation. Cobra Killer, featured on NBC's Snapped Killer Couples, pulls back the glitzy veil of the gay porn industry to expose a story of deceit, greed, and the ultimate betrayal. Cobra Killer, gay porn, murder, and the manhunt to bring the killers to justice, tells the story of online gay porn entrepreneur Brian Kosis, whose brutal near decapitation on a Wednesday in early 2007 sent shockwaves through the small Pennsylvania town where he ran his porn empire. The basis for the Christian Slater film King Cobra, Cobra Killer has been called an addictive page-turner that you won't want to put down by the San Diego LGBT Weekly and a grisly, gripping documentary account of the 2007 murder by Passport Magazine, Cobra Killer, Gay Porn, Murder, and the Manhunt to Bring the Killers to Justice by Andrew E. Stoner and Peter A. Conway, available on Amazon in paperback and ebook or at bookstores nationwide. We are back. I have a fresh cup of coffee and a new pack of cigarettes. So when we left off, Marie Kono had disappeared and police were making a very big deal about this, driving through the neighborhoods, blasting on loudspeakers about parents needing to keep their children in sight at all times. Parents began to walk their school-age children to their schools. Police listed Kono's disappearance as a missing person case. However, according to numerous sources, inwardly the police force figured that Marie Kono had been murdered and treated her disappearance as such. They sent out flyers to train stations, businesses, everywhere that they could think to in order to get the news of this young girl's disappearance out. And they eventually got some eyewitnesses in the form of two boys who stated that they saw Marie Kono walking with a man near the Aruna River. Well, the newspaper that Mizaki's parents owned interviewed an individual who stated that they had seen Kono walking with a stranger who was described as being in their late 30s, 5 foot 6 inches tall, with a pudgy round face and curly hair, wearing white slacks and a white summer sweater. Now, a few days after Marie Kono disappeared, her mother stated that she received a postcard stating, quote, there are devils about. And Mrs. Kono brought this postcard to the police who dismissed it as being from someone who was playing a cruel prank on the family. Mizomo returned to visit Mary's body a few times after she died. It's been stated that on a number of occasions, right after she died, he took parts of bone from her body, although it seems that for the most part he left the corpse intact at least for a period of time. Four weeks after Marie Kono went missing, the police marked her case as inactive as they could not find any evidence to suggest what might have happened to her in terms of who had taken her. Somewhere during this four-week period, the family received the box with the ashes, and they knew that she was dead at that point. However, they did not know who had taken her, unfortunately, and it seems as though Mizaki was in a cool-down period, which we all know many serial killers go through after taking a life. They will internalize what they have done, and many times they will relive what they have done until such a point where reliving the 
actions that they took no longer suffice and they have to go out and find another victim. On October 3rd, 1988, Mizaki was driving through the Hano Saitama Prefecture, which is in the Kanto region. And if you remember from the Junko Furuta case that we covered a few weeks back, the prefectures are pretty much like states, and inside of them you have counties, and inside of these counties, obviously, you have towns and major cities. So he's driving in this area, which is roughly an hour outside of Tokyo, on the afternoon of October 3rd, when he spots a first grader who is seven-year-old Masami Yoshisawa, who is walking along a road by herself and... Satomo pulled up alongside of her and convinced the young girl to get inside of his car. As with Marie, he drove out to this wooded area known as the Komine Pass, where they got out of the car and walked a short distance. From what I understand, this area is pretty popular for hiking, and he brought this young girl out into the middle of nowhere before strangling her to death and removing her clothing, at which time he sexually assaulted her corpse. Apparently, the body began to go through its death throes after Satami was done assaulting her, and it frightened him as he believed that the girl's spirit had returned, and he ran off, leaving her roughly about a hundred yards from where he had left Marie's body. When she did not return home that night, Masami's parents contacted the police, who reacted by searching the area and putting out flyers and placards all over the prefecture in an attempt to find Masami or any witnesses who may have seen her being abducted. Unfortunately, from what I could find, nobody witnessed this particular abduction and she ended up being listed simply as a missing person. The police did compare Masami and Marie's disappearances, although because they had no bodies and they had no witnesses in this particular abduction, they were unable to link the two at the time, at least publicly. Although I imagine, given the fact that crimes against children were very rare at this point, they probably linked the two of them together privately, and began investigating them as such. On December 12, 1988, saw a four-year-old girl, Erica Namba, as she was walking home from a friend's house, and he, as with the others, he got this girl into his car. However, this crime would be a little different, as opposed to driving out to the nature reserve, Mizaki drove to a parking lot in Naguri. This parking lot belonged to the Youth Nature House. By the time they reached this parking lot, darkness had fallen and Mizaki demanded the young girl climb into the back seat and undress, at which point he began taking photographs of her. According to... Mazaki, as he's taking photographs of Erica, a car drove by and he believed that he was nearly caught. At this point, Erica began to cry again and Mazaki strangled her to death, at which point he molested the young girl's body before tying her hands and feet with a nylon cord. Mazaki ends up taking Erica's clothing and disposing of it in the woods, which is a change from what we've already seen, where he's taking the clothing with him to keep. 
He's actually getting rid of her clothing at this point. And then he comes back to the car and wraps her body inside of a sheet which he places inside of the trunk of his car before driving out of the youth nature house. And as he's driving away, he isn't paying attention and gets his car stuck in a ditch. Realizing he's got the body in the back of the car, Mizaki opens the trunk of his vehicle, pulls the sheet out, and walks the body out into the woods where he disposes of it. Upon returning to his car, Mizaki finds two men standing there, and according to his statements, he casually placed the sheet back into the trunk of the car before explaining to them that he had gotten the vehicle stuck and the two men agree to help him get the vehicle out, at which point Mizaki drives off into the night. Obviously, when Erica doesn't return home that night, her family contacts the police, and sources differ as to the chain of events of which happened first, if the police immediately connected all three of the disappearances, or if they connected them after finding Erica's body. Either way, that point is moot. The next day, December 13th, workers at the Youth Nature House discover Erica's clothing in the woods, and they contact the police who come out in force and begin to comb the area trying to find further evidence. Unfortunately, they don't find anything. And as this is going on, Erica's school takes the step of making up flyers with her picture on it and, you know, missing child and plastering it all over the neighborhood. The following day, though, the police actually find Erica's body in the woods. They note that her hands are and feet are tied, and they also note that she was, give or take, about two hours from her home. This sets off a major panic in the Sotama area, because now it's confirmed by the police that there is, in fact, an individual who is targeting young girls and killing them. The Satama police force ends up creating a task force whose sole job is to both find the remains of these young girls, but also to stop the man responsible for killing these children. About a week after Erica's body was discovered, her father, Shinichi Namba, received a postcard, unlike the postcard that the Konas had received. However, the letters of this one were cut out of a magazine and placed onto a piece of paper, which was then photocopied and enlarged. And this one simply read, Erica, cold, cough, throat, rest, death. With this third disappearance and murder of Erica Namba, the news of these three disappearances and murders was all over the media in Saitama. From many reports that I've read, it was constantly on the news, in the newspapers, on billboards, on the sides of buses, and other forms of mass transportation. And people were simply saying that there's nothing we can do to stop this except for trust to the police. And I think that kind of shows the difference, or one of the many differences between Eastern and Western culture, where if a thing like this were to be happening inside of, say, Great Britain or the United States, there would be a very vocal outpouring from the public demanding that the police 
catch this individual and you might even get some people who took to vigilante actions in an effort to try and capture the person responsible while there was apprehension and fear among people in the Saitama region they were content enough to sit back and allow to the police to do their their job without protesting and screaming from the balconies that they needed to catch this monster. After the death of Erika, Mazaki went through a prolonged cooling off period. If you'll recall when I talked about Marie's death, Mazaki returned to her body a number of times. Well, after murdering Erika, he returned to Marie's body yet again. At this point, real putrefaction and decomposition had taken place, and he took her hands and her feet, meaning the bones. He also took the rest of her bones and brought them back to his home, where he placed them inside of a furnace and burned them before grinding the bones into powder. And on the morning of... February 6th, Shigeo Kono, Marie's father, opened his front door to find a large box sitting on his stoop. Inside of this box were Marie's ashes, some of her teeth, photographs of her clothing, along with a note card that read, Marie Bones, cremated, investigated, prove. Initially, a doctor working for the Tokyo Dental University stated that he did not believe the teeth actually belonged to Marie. He changed this, however, after the police held a press conference and stated that they believed that they in fact did, and this received some pretty heavy national attention as this doctor was forced to come back and say, you know, he was mistaken in his misidentification of these teeth. Before the doctor could make this statement, however, Satomo, who as with many serial killers, was following news reports about his various crimes, he heard this and sent a letter to the Kono family. Now, I've been able to find part of this three-page letter online. I'm going to read it to you here, this small piece. I put the cardboard box with Marie's remains in front of her home. I did everything, from the start of the Marie incident to the finish. I saw the police press conference where they said the remains were not Marie's. On camera, her mother said the report gave her new hope that Marie might still be alive. I knew then that I had to write this confession so Marie's mother would not continue to hope in vain. I say again, the remains are Marie's. It was signed with Yuko Amada which apparently means, now I'll tell. This letter caused a lot of chaos within the Sotama Police Department, and it forced them to declare that the remains actually did belong to Marie. Police got handwriting experts to look at this letter, although unfortunately they were not able to figure out the sex of the perpetrator. The police took the next step of creating pamphlets containing the letter and distributed it among the population of Satama in the hopes that somebody would recognize this handwriting and maybe the style of writing and be able to point them in the right direction as to who had written it. See, at this point you can see that Sutomo, who has always felt as though he were a nothing and different than others. He's really reveling in the media attention and the panic that his crimes are causing throughout the area. 
very similar, in fact, to the mindset of the Zodiac Killer as well as the BTK. They both, of those individuals, at least with the BTK, it's known that he did this. It's suspected that the Zodiac did this as well. They followed their cases very heavily in the media because committing the crime was only part of the fantasy for them. The other part of that fantasy was getting to see the reaction from the public and the fear that it was causing, and that further helped to build this fantasy life that they had going inside of their heads and was another form of gratification for them. And this kind of gratification helps to extend the period of time helps to extend that gratification and that reliving that these killers go through before they have to go out and commit another crime. We can see this in the things that Stoma did. He sent letters to the other two victims. Now he's sending remains to Marie's family when it's announced that they don't believe that the remains are Marie's. He sends a letter, but on the day Marie's family had their funeral for her, he sends another letter in which Tsutomo basically describes in graphic detail how he watched over the period of months since he had killed Marie her body decomposing. The re letter reads in part, Before I knew it, the child's corpse had gone rigid. I wanted to cross her hands over her breast, but they wouldn't budge. Pretty soon, the body gets red spots all over it. Big red spots. Like the Hinamaru flag. Or like you'd covered her whole body with red Henko seals. After a while, the body is covered with stretch marks. It was so rigid before, but now it feels like it's full of water. And it smells, how it smells, like nothing you've ever smelled in this whole wide world. One thing that has always puzzled me with this case is, by all indications, Tomo was actually bringing these letters and the package with Marie's remains to the family's home. Why did the police never set up a stakeout of some sort to see who it was that might be dropping these items off? You would think after the first package arrived that they would have someone out there to watch, or at least after the second package with the confession letter in it. But they don't appear to have done any of that. In fact, it appears that they just kept their nose to the grindstone and didn't even think about that. Now, I could be wrong. He may have mailed these things to the family, but from everything I could find, he was actually delivering them his himself. By the time summer came around, Satomo had begun to lose that euphoric sense that he had experienced following the murder of Erica as well as the media uproar his various actions had caused so much so that he eventually starts taking off from work to hide within his fantasy world where it's said that he spent the majority of his time watching his videotapes and editing them to get quote unquote the best parts into sequences for his own enjoyment. But he also began trolling again for another victim. It's known that at some point in the early part of June, he saw a group of young girls playing outside of an elementary school and was able to coax one of the girls away from the others, at which point he t removed her undergarments and began photographing her. A couple of sources state that in addition to this, he also did molest the girls before being interrupted by neighbors who chased him off and thus saved this girl from possibly a worse fate. On June 6th, Sutomu ended up going to 
the tennis courts near Tokyo Bay, although they were closed, leading him to head to a park where he encountered a five-year-old girl by the name of Ayaku Nomoto. Upon finding Ayaku alone, he asked the girl if he could take some pictures from of her, to which she agreed, and according to his own account, he took these pictures of the girls in, in an effort to get her comfortable with him before convincing her that, hey, now we've taken these, let's take some more pictures inside of my car. Upon getting the girl into his vehicle, she apparently commented on his hands, which made Satomo go into a rage, at which point he par put on a pair of gloves and strangled her to death. This is coming from his own confession. After murdering Ayako, he took tape and placed it over her mouth before tying her hands with vinyl rope. Lastly, he took her body and wrapped it up in a sheet and put it in the trunk of his car. This crime is different from the others, as after killing the young girl and placing her into the trunk of the car, Tomo does not drive to the woods to get rid of the body. Instead, he goes to a video store and rents a camera before returning home. I'm not going to get into the details of what happened. If you really want to know what took place, you can find them online. However, I will say that he brought this young girl's body to his house and began videotaping her in various disturbing positions while he pleasured himself before tying her hands and feet back up and covering her with sheets. He left her body inside of his home for a few days, and when it began to putrefy, he realized that he needed to do something about this, so he went and got a knife and butchered her body removing the hands, head, and feet in order to hamper identification before dropping the torso next to a public toilet. By his own admission after this, Mizaki returned to his home where he took the young girl's hands and cooked them in the backyard, at which point he ate parts of the flesh before disposing of the remains that he had held on to in the woods across the street from his house on a large hillside. As with the other disappearances and murder, Ayako Nomoto's disappearance read to widespread panic. It was all over the media, and Satomu reveled in this, realizing that the police were nowhere near to catching him. He did eventually come to the conclusion, however, that disposing of her remains across the street from his house was a major risk, and roughly two weeks after this took place, he went and retrieved the remains and disposed of them inside of a plastic bag, which he placed into a storeroom behind his bedroom. You do see this kind of thing quite often with certain serial killers. They have to keep mementos, and oftentimes it's parts of the body. A grisly keepsake, if you will, Tomo stated that he had taken the head, hands, and feet back because he was fearful the police or someone in the public would find them and would in fact tie the crime back to him. I don't believe that. I think that he was feeling the need to keep parts of the young girl close to him, and that is the reason that he went and got them back from the woods and kept them so close to where he was living. On July 23rd of 1989, Mizaki was driving around in his car when he saw two sisters playing in a park in Hachioji, which is inside of Tokyo. Reports state that 
he approached the two girls and ordered the older of the two, an eight-year-old, to remain where she, he was before convincing the younger child to go with him. However, the older sister ended up running home to inform her father of what had taken place. This man runs back to the park where his daughters had been playing, and he finds his younger daughter naked with this man who is taking pictures of her pubic region and the father knocks the man to the ground. While this is going on, the police had been contacted probably by this girl's mother. So they arrive on scene to see Satomo break free of this enraged father and attempt to run off. However, for some reason, he decides he needs to get back to his car, probably for a means of escape, and he takes off back to the car, at which point he is arrested for enticing a minor to lewd acts. So they take Satama back to the police station, and they get a warrant to go search his home, and upon searching it, the police discover... And this number is stated on numerous different websites concerning this case. 5,763 videotapes. Most of this was pornographic material concerning minors. Some of it was horror movies, while others had anime on it. The police pretty much felt that they had their killer, although Satama would not confess. Despite this, media reports were stating that the police had, in fact, found the serial killer, and at least according to one report that I found, a housewife was quoted as stating that the prior to this date of July 23rd, the police were in the habit of doing daily checks at houses throughout the city in an effort to try and gather information about the man or individual that they were seeking. But on the day that they arrested Satama, these searches stopped, and in fact the news reports were stating that they had captured the individual that they were looking for. The media believed so heavily in Sutama's guilt that they actually arrived at the man's home before the police did and were thus able to get photographs inside of the home before the police arrived and forced them outside. In the U.S., that would be a major no-no as the defense team could then use that in some degree to say that the media had tainted the crime scene or possibly planted evidence which could thus possibly lead to a mistrial, although that is not the case here because there was just too much damning evidence inside Sutama's room. In August, Mazaki officially confesses to committing murder, specifically that of Ayako Nomoto, whose skull was found in the hills outside of Okutama. On September 6th, Masami Yoshizawa's remains were found in the room behind his bedroom. Mazaki ended up being found competent to stand trial, and interestingly enough, his father refused to hire defense attorneys for his son, stating, quote, unquote, it would be unfair to the families. And it took a little while before the public defender's office was able to find two lawyers willing to represent him. Such was the disdain that Mazawa was held in. His trial began on March 30th of 1990, and his defense obviously tried to play the not 
guilty by reason of insanity defense with Bazaki taking the stand and quote unquote talking in nonsensical fashion and t- speaking of an alter ego whom he called the rat man that Mizaki claimed forced him to commit the killings. Now, at least according to one source I could find, Mizaki's father ended up committing suicide out of shame over what his son had done in 1994. However, I only found this on two websites, so I can't say for certain whether or not that is in fact the case. What I do know is that his trial stretched on for seven years, and it focused on his mental state during the period of time that he was committing the crimes. Eventually, it was decided that he did in fact know right from wrong and was therefore under Japanese law legally responsible for committing the crimes which he had done. Tomo ends up being convicted and sentenced to death, which was carried out on June 17th of 2008 at the Tokyo Detention House, where he was hung in conjunction with two other individuals who had also been convicted of murder. He was 45 years old. I'm going to take a brief moment to discuss something I mentioned at the beginning of the show, which is that Mazaki had a very deep-seated interest in anime and manga, which led to him being dubbed as the otaku murderer. Now, in Japan, the word otaku, spelled O-T-A-K-U, means someone who has an all-consuming interest, particularly, and this is coming from Wikipedia, anime, manga, video games, or computers, and it's really used as a prerogative term for someone whose entire life revolves around these things. And the moral panic that arose was basically that Mazaki's crimes had stemmed from his unhealthy interests in these subjects, particularly anime and manga, really didn't focus too much on the fact that his real interest was child pornography. And we have seen these kinds of things in the United States before. People trying to blame someone's crimes on the violent video games they play or on the music they listen to because it is understood that These individuals are living within a fantasy world of their own creation and that they use these things that they find to help build this fantasy world. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the thing that these people focus on is the root cause of them committing these crimes. Moreover, it's a tool that they have used in order to build their fantasy world and to cope with the world around them, which they don't feel they are a part of. In Japan, there was a real big push to do away with the anime, manga, and horror movie cultures, specifically because of Mizaka's interest in them and how heavily he had lost himself inside of these worlds. I'm going to posit that he would have focused on something else entirely had these subjects not existed within Japanese culture. It could very well have been, you know, that he lost himself inside a world where Toys were his main focus of interest, and that was his all-consuming hobby. It just so happens that the things that he focused his mind upon also had to do with the things that were of interest to him in his deepest, darkest places. Namely, 
the sexual assault and murder of young girls, which, while I'm not stating that all of the things that he was looking at as far as manga and anime contained this type of material, anime and manga do contain a lot of violence towards women. So, it was for him, it was simply an outlet to read about the things that he was feeling internally. And he used them to feed that rich and disturbing fantasy life that he had. One did not begat the other. Mizaki even stated that his feelings towards children and towards murder existed in him from as far back as he could remember. And that finding anime and manga just further helped him to feed those ideas that were within him. He also stated that he killed animals. It's known that he strangled a dog that he had had, as well as murdered numerous cats, one of which he said he threw into a river after strangling it, which is part of the triad that the FBI uses in order to establish whether somebody is a potential serial killer, he's a harmon of the animal, setting of fires, and bedwetting. We don't know about bedwetting or the setting of fires as far as Mizaki was concerned, but he did state that he did kill animals, so he's at least got one of the three. And as I stated a few moments ago, whether he found anime and manga is inconsequential. He would have found something to help feed the dark desires that were inside of him. In fact, he did. Yes, he was into these other things more so than the majority of people, but he was heavily into child pornography, as can be seen by the thousands of videotapes he had of it, as well as the fact that he was willing to go out into public and videotape unsuspecting girls in an effort to try and get pictures of their pubic regions. We have reached the end of this episode, and for my friends in Japan, Dozo Tenoshimi Kodosai. This one was specifically for you guys because, as I said at the beginning of the show, there was such an overwhelming response on the last case that I did covering Japan, I felt that you might enjoy this one as well, and I hope that you did. For all of you, again, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving a five-star review wherever it is that you get your favorite podcasts. Like and share the show on social media. Until next time, the Death Cast is a production of Corpse Creek Publishing. Stay morbid.